Jesus said, I will. God has made you and I promises. And God's promises are yea and amen. God's promises are certain. God's promises carries a surety with it. God's promises are given to us in such a way that He can give us confidence knowing that what He has said, He will do. You'll notice there in your outline that this, unlike most of my messages, is a topical message. So we will be jetting to a number of passages of Scripture. I've given most of them to you in the handout. But I wanted to let you know in case you needed to limber up your Bible a little bit or get your Bible app open so that we can jet around. But before we get into the I wills of Jesus Christ, it's important we lay a foundation because the I wills, the promises that Jesus Jesus gave us are built on a foundation. They're not only built on a foundation, but they are substantiated by God Himself. They're not only that, but they are certain because they come from God Himself. Three things that I want you to see about God as it pertains to Him and His promises. Number one is this God keeps His promises. Wow, four people have had to know God's promise before really bad in your life. God keeps His promises. God's not like mankind. Some people make you a promise and they may or may not keep that promise. Too many people are those that will make promises but never keep them. They're promise makers. They can make them all day long. But the keeping of the promise is where the real proof is in the character of the person that's spoken. And God keeps His promises. One of the verses, and there are many in the Bible, is in Hebrews 10.23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Here's why. For He who promised is faithful. God is faithful. He's a promise maker and a promise keeper. Let the church say amen. God, number two, God is always faithful. The reason I have to throw always in there is because we live in a fallen world and we've seen the unfaithfulness of so many things in life. The things that were certain years ago that are no longer certain. The ways that certain people have treated us in our life have proven that not everyone is faithful. So it's an important reminder for us to look at the Scriptures and remind ourselves that God is, say the word always, always faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13, one of my favorite verses, though I believe my wife has said to me a time or two, I say that about a lot of Bible verses. But for today, we're going to say this is my favorite Bible verse. If we are faithless, God remains faithful. Why? He He cannot deny himself. God does not just define faithfulness. He is faithfulness. It's not just something he talks about. It's not just something he put in the Bible so you and I would have a word with a definition. He is the very attribute of faithfulness itself. And that's why God cannot be faithless because that would deny himself. So God is always faithful to you and I. And I, and I know I brought this principle out before when we did our series in 2 Timothy, but just as a refresher for you this morning, God's faithfulness is not even dependent upon your faithfulness. No matter how faithful you are or are not to God, God's faithfulness never changes. He will always be faithful. Third thing I want you to see as we finish laying this foundation for our message this morning, and that is this. Number three, God does not lie. God does not lie. If you've ever met someone who lied, say, I have. I I didn't say look at somebody. I said, say, I have. My goodness, 14 of you darted your eyes across the room. (laughs) God cannot, does not, and will not lie. 
Numbers 23, 19 says this, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, or will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? One of the greatest definitions I found for this verse here, a commentary for this verse, reads like this. God is holy, Isaiah 6, 3. And that quality makes it impossible for God to lie. God does not conform to any standard of purity. He is the standard. God is absolutely holy with an infinite purity, incapable of being changed. Because of His holiness, here's the key, because of His holiness, when God speaks, He will not and cannot lie. He never deceives. He never distorts or misrepresents what He says or does. Lying is, it would be against the very nature of God, end quote. God cannot lie. So with that foundation, when we come to these promises that Jesus makes us in the form of I will statements, in the New Testament, we have some assurance that those really are true, that those really are promises that will not only be given to us, but also kept. Let's look at them together. There's only seven of them this morning. The reason I said there's only seven, you, if you look in your Bible and many notes you've probably written in your Bible, you will find out a lot more than seven I wills of Jesus. We just are going to look at seven of them this morning. Number one is this. Jesus said, I will I will give you rest. I will give you rest. As two of you looking for a nap this afternoon should have said amen on that. I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28, Jesus clearly spoke and he said this, quote, Come to me, all, not some, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and here's the promise, and I will give you rest. Literally from the Greek it means I will rest you. I will give you the rest that you need. But I want you to notice this. If you want rest from God, you have to go to God to get it. The reason I say that is, is when we truly need it, we tend to go to all the wrong places to get it. We think rest for our soul is going to find, find we're going to find rest for our soul if we binge watch our favorite series on Netflix. I didn't say this wouldn't be personal this morning. We think it's found sometimes in a relationship or economic security or something else that will bring us rest for our souls. But folks, listen to me loud and clear. True rest for your soul is only found in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ through the blood He shed on the cross and the death and His resurrection. That is where we find true peace, true rest. And if we want that, we must go to Him, listen to me, not the other way around. Jesus said for you to come to Him. And then He will give you rest. There's a second I will from Jesus, a second promise here we're going to look at today. Number two is this. Jesus said, I will give you wisdom. I will give you wisdom. Luke chapter 21 verse 15, the verse is this, for Jesus speaking, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. Now, now write in your notes there, this verse is in the context of verses 10 through 15. In this context, Jesus speaking throughout all of those verses is talking about pestilence. He's talking about a famine that are going to happen. He's talking about a persecution that's going to happen for those that follow Jesus Christ. He's talking about you'll be dragged before kings and courts and all of those things. And what he's assuring you of is in the midst of all of that persecution, in the midst of all that chaos, in the midst of all that quote unquote, to use a modern phrase today, in the midst of all that unfairness that's going on in your life, Jesus wants to remind you that in that moment He will give you the wisdom so strong that it will contradict and resist your adversaries. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Amen. He gives you something greater than the enemies that are coming against you and that is His wisdom. His wisdom. And I want to throw one more thing in here. Write down, just put verse 13 underneath that line there. Verse 13 reads this. After Jesus 
Jesus listed all the bad things that were going to happen. And here's why I want to mention this. A lot of times when we hear all those, it's like, oh, great, as if I wasn't already having a bad week. And then he says this in verse 13, because right before that he said all this stuff, pestilence, famine, um, persecution, everything else is for my name's sake, it says. Then he says this verse, verse 13. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. It will turn out for you an occasion for testimony. That means that when the whole world is falling apart and you are not falling apart because you know God, because you have the peace of God, because you have the presence of God in your life, it will all in the midst of hard, difficult times turn into an opportunity for you to testify to who God is and what he can do. That's what happens in the midst of our bad times. We miss that sometimes. When difficult times come along, it's really just another opportunity to testify to the goodness of God. That the same God that got you through the last big problem is the same God that's going to get you through the next big problem. The God that healed you before can heal you again. The God that spoke to you once before loud and clear, though you feel like His voice is faint and in another room, He will speak to you again again. God is faithful like that. The Bible's very clear. He says, I will give you wisdom. Well, Jonathan, I'm, I'm really needing wisdom. I feel like it's not really quite showed up yet. Well, let me give you just one more help here. And that is this. If you need wisdom, all you have to do is ask for it. All you have to do is ask for it. James chapter 1, verse number 5 is very, very clear. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him what? Ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And here's a promise. And it will be given to him. Notice there are no parameters on that. There's not a lid on that. There's not some exceptions to that. God just says if you are in a position where you need wisdom about a decision, wisdom about a direction, or whatever it is in your life... If you call on the one, the Bible says in Psalms, whose understanding is infinite, if you call on the one who is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, God will give you the wisdom that you need. That's a wonderful promise when you think about it. That means every time I hit an uncertainty in my life, I can call on God. Every time I hit this place, as, a, as I remember as a young dad, I, I didn't know anything about having kids. I always teased my boys when they were real little. I told my oldest son, I said, hey, you were an experiment. You're going to need counseling, but your younger brother would be just fine, you know. I mean, you work all the bugs out on the first one, you know. Uh, I didn't know what I needed, but I could pray and ask God to give me wisdom. Sometimes I don't know a certain direction for where I need to go in ministry or something else. And we can pray and God will give you wisdom for that. There's no parameters on that. None whatsoever. You need wisdom? Ask God and God gives it to all. Number three is this. Jesus said, I will confess you before my Father. I will confess you before my Father. Matthew chapter 10 verse 32 and 33. Again, the words of Jesus. He says, therefore... Whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But, contrast here, but whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Interestingly enough, as I was studying out this specific passage of Scripture, a number of Bible teachers attributed the biblical principle of reaping and sowing to this verse. You stand up for God, God stands up for you. You try to stand against God, God will stand against you. You confess God, He's going to confess you. You deny Him, He's going to deny you. If you and I ever get in this place where we're denying Him, it's a dangerous place to be. Well, Jonathan, I, I don't want to be there. How do I, what are the times and the ways in which some people deny Jesus Christ and deny Him? Let me give you three of them. Some do it in their words. It's pretty blazing, but some people do it with their words. And I've had people do that with me before. I've had people that I've witnessed who just flat out called God names and said they didn't want anything to do with Him at all. Didn't believe in Him, didn't want to believe in Him. Thought I was crazy. That last part might have a little truth to it. Uh, <laughs> that was for all of you that were listening. And that felt really good about 12 of you are listening. That's great. I like that. <laughs> but sometimes it's with our words. 
Simon Peter did it. Don't think we're beyond it. I don't know who he is. He was carried away and he's over there. But who that is, I have no idea. And he goes over here, you know. Hey, you were with that man that was arrested. No, 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 no. I don't know who he is. One more time. Hey, I don't know who he is. You see, we deny sometimes with our words. Another way that we can deny Jesus and deny it is, number two, our silence. Sometimes our silence is what denies it. God gives you, I call it that evangelism opportunity, that door of evangelism that is so wide you can drive a Mack truck through it and you walk right past it. Where you had a chance to stand up for God or blatantly ask a question. And the best you could respond with, well, not telling you what to do. Everybody has their own different way of believing. We must be cautious, my brothers and sisters, to stay away from this denying him through our words or our silence. Number three, some deny him through their actions. How does that play out? It plays out this way where you say one thing, but what? Do another. It's a phrase even in our culture. It's speaking of someone who's duplistic, someone who says, yeah, 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 this is what I believe, this is how I, this is how I am, so on and so forth. And then everything over here contradicts everything that they do. We have other phrases for that. It's important that you walk the talk and you talk the walk. That means your life should be congruous. That whatever you say that you believe should be the way that you live. And if we don't, at some level, there's an element of us denying who God is, His character, and what we're to live for. Number four is this. Jesus said, I will pray. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> I love it that Jesus promises us that He's going to pray. There are several places in the Bible that talks about this, but we're going to zero in on John chapter 14, verse number 16. And in the context here, Jesus has just got through sharing that He's going away. Way, but he's sending another comforter to them. Listen to this verse. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. It's very interesting in the book, in the in the Bible, the many times that we find Jesus praying for us. John 17, 17, and the great high priestly prayer, we call it, where Jesus was praying to the Father and praying that God would keep His children and keep them by His truth. We also find in the Bible in that encounter in Luke chapter 22, where Jesus and Simon Peter were talking, and Jesus looked straight at Simon Peter and said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as we, but I have have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. All these many places where Jesus has prayed for you and I. But I love this one here, though, because it speaks of him saying, I'm going to pray to the Father. And exactly what you need is exactly what you're going to get, which is the helper, the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit that is going to come and help you in this life. The Holy Spirit is, I love what our pastor was given direction earlier about when we had the tongues and interpretation, one of the gifts of the Spirit that was taken place here this morning. What a wonderful pairing with the message this morning to be able to see the Holy Spirit in action and how He works. But the Holy Spirit is for more than just inside these four walls, folks. He's a whole lot more than just someone that all of a sudden the Holy Spirit works if we're in here, but when we get out there, He's nowhere to be found. It's not true. He is an abiding presence in your life. He is someone the Bible says it will be a helper. He's going to be a comforter. He will lead and guide you into all truth. Truth. The Bible says the Holy Spirit, when it comes time to testify and to witness about Jesus, in that very hour, the Holy Spirit will give you exactly what to say. Let's also go a little bit further because I think we're in a Pentecostal church this morning. The Bible says that when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can be a witness to Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Overland Park, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Yeah. 
the Holy Spirit is very real and it came about in this verse here where Jesus was explaining that he prayed to the Father for us that we would have this Holy Spirit. I give you one other verse there that or it may or may not be in your notes so write it down if it's not but Hebrews 7 25 another one of my many favorite verses in the Bible but it says therefore he is also speaking of Jesus able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him then here it is since he always lives to make intercession for them did you know Jesus Christ intercedes for you and I intercession literally in the Greek means this it means to fall in with someone to fall in with them that means that if I show up at your house, I'm going to pick on Jerry and Barbara Bramlett. They're on the back row back there. I show up at Jerry and Barbara's house to say hi to them. And I pull up and Barbara's been out shopping and bought a brand new washer and jet washing machine. And Jerry's trying to get it off the back of the truck and get it into the house. Well, being a good friend, I'm going to see Jerry doing that. And I'm going to come alongside Jerry and I'm going to fall in with him. And Jerry and I together, because we're two manly men, so Jerry and I together, we're going to grab the washer washer, no straps. We don't even need a dolly. We're just going to carry it all the way in. We're going to put it where Barbara wants it. She'll say another quarter inch this way, another half inch that way, forward just a little bit more. Okay, all right, let's dust it and we're ready, you know. We'll put it right where she wants it. What happened? I came alongside, saw something that someone that was in need and I fell in with them. Jesus sees us in our need and he falls in with us and he intercedes for us for the very thing that we need. Sometimes that we don't even know that we need and he intercedes for you and I. Paul uses this same word again also in 1 Timothy chapter 2 when talking to the believers and he said that intercession be made for all men. That we see a need and we fall in when someone comes to the altar, when there's an altar response to pray for unsaved children and grandchildren and they come forward saying, that's my family. I have unsaved loved ones. And you see that and your heart moves for them and you come forward and put hands on their shoulders and, and you begin to pray with them. What are you doing? You're interceding for them. You're falling in with them in their time of need and coming alongside them. That's what Jesus Christ does for you and I. He didn't just come to this earth and die for our sins and go back to heaven and drink, drink coffee and, and eat biscuits until it's time to come back. No, He's interceding for you and I. If you're grateful, say, I'm grateful. Amen. I'm grateful too. Here's another one for you. Jesus said, I will never leave you. Amen. Notice the word never. Please, I beg you, underline, highlight, notice the word never. Jesus will never, ever, ever, ever leave you, according to this verse here. Look at it with me very closely. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now keep in mind, the letter to the Hebrews was written to a group of those that had left Judaic practices of religion and had become new followers of Jesus Christ. And the entire book is written to show that Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than the blood of bulls and goats. Jesus is better here. Jesus is better there. All the way through to encourage them because when they stepped out in faith to follow Jesus Christ, many of them were excommunicated from their family. Some of them would have lost their jobs because of this radical decision to follow Jesus Christ. They were under a difficult uh, time in their life but yet still in this newfound relationship with Jesus Christ. This letter was intended to build their faith and to build them up and to help them keep moving forward, even giving us an entire chapter of examples of great heroic faith so that we would build up our faith and continue to follow Jesus Christ. And this promise that is being made here to them is to remind them that though other people excommunicate you, though other people walk away from you, though other people want no nothing to do with you like you thought they would do with you because of your relationship with God not to worry because God is going nowhere God will stay right next to you closer than ever before
closer. The Bible is very clear. It says that, that he's a very present help even in time of trouble. The psalmist says, for God is a very present help in times of trouble. Very present. Notice the emphasis there. Very present help in time of trouble. Almost to imply that the more trouble you're in, the more the presence of God would be around you. Here he's promising you and I, I'll never leave you. And then he also says this, nor forsake you. In other words, this verse promises that God will neither withdraw from us his presence, nor remove from us his help in this life that we're living in. It's an important promise for you and I, and it's something we can bank on. I want you to look at another Jesus said here, and that is this, verse number 6. Jesus said, I will by no means cast you out. John chapter 6, verse number 37. Jesus again speaking, obviously, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. I want you to notice here, one, one old preacher from the 1800s, I was reading one of his sermons on this text a few weeks ago, and he said this, this is where the divine and the human meet, right here. This is the divine where God is saying, Jesus is saying this, all that the Father gives me, all the children of His that He gives me, all those that He bring comes unto me that are heavy, uh, heavy laden and He's going to give them rest. All that come to Him and are drawn to come to Him for salvation in a relationship with Him, that He in no wise, no way, no means, no way whatsoever will cast them out. Here's what you can write above that verse. God, when you go to God, He will never reject you. He will never reject you. You want a good illustration for that? Write down Luke chapter 15. You can go and read it later on. Uh, or if you get bored in a minute, you can go ahead and read it here at the end of my message. But uh, thank you for that one laughter. Uh, but in Luke chapter 15, we have the, par the lost parables. The one in there I want to point out, though, is the, par the prodigal son. The son did what was wrong. He did. He, 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 came. he didn't do necessarily anything that was wrong by going to his father and asking for the inheritance. It's what he did with it to shame the family name, to, to live in what the Bible called, I believe in the King James says, riotous living. He was a party animal. He began to just live a very licentious lifestyle. And he found himself, and if you're going to try to live a lifestyle like that and you got money, let me tell you, there will be plenty of friends to help you spend it. There'll be plenty of places to spend it all. And when it was all gone, and ultimately found himself in a pig pen, cleaning, uh, feeding pigs, slopping hogs, as we call it in Arkansas, that he even looked at the pods, that leftover food that you and I would never eat. We eat the kernels on the inside. We eat the seed. We eat the edamame. We just don't eat the hull. We eat the soybean. We just don't eat the shell that it comes in. Purple hull peas, whatever other illustration you want. Those are thrown out for the hogs. And he was so desperate that that began to look good. That became his only option for a sustenance. And the Bible says he came to himself. And when he came to himself, it was an awakening that was going on in him. And he began to remember the goodness of his father all those years of living in his dad's home. And he said, you know, my dad was so good to his employees. I'm just going to go home and just try to become one of his employees. I'll, I'll fare far better than ever here. And maybe, just maybe, if I repent, my dad would take me back as an employee. But you see what happened was different than what he thought would. He came back home just to be an employee for his father, hoping for that, dreaming that maybe that's what could happen in his life. And the father runs and meets him in the driveway, falls on him. Remember where he just came from, a pigsty. His father, this wealthy man, falls on him and begins to kiss his neck as his son. And begin to show that affection to his own child. And then his, his child was saying, no, no. And he was saying, you know, I don't deserve this. And that kind of thing. The father began to yell out to the servants and those that are around him, go and get a, the best robe and put it on him. Kill the fatty calf. My son that I thought was lost now is found. When we come to God, no matter what we have done wrong, no matter what we think or what the enemy has tried to make us think is so bad that God would never take us back, it's not true. When you turn to God, 
with a broken and a contrite heart, he will not reject you. Amen. He will not turn you away. He will willingly take you back. He will love on you. He will forgive you. He will lavish you with grace in your life and make you brand new because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. He by no means will ever cast your eye out. That leads us to the seventh, and I told you there were many, but I left it to seven. Jesus said, I will come again. Oh, I will. We're Pentecostal. I thought we could have done better now. I will come again. <laughs> Amen. Jesus Christ is coming back. Look in John 14 again. He just broke the news to his disciples that, that he's getting ready to go away. And the disciples were, were confused and they were, and they were concerned. They had ang angst and anxiety about this whole thing about we just were really on a roll, Jesus, and you're going to go away. And then he says this in John 14 and 3. And if I go and prepare prepare a place for you, I will come again. I'm going to say it again. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. What a wonderful thing. It's not, a, the rapture is going to be a great thing. Don't get me wrong. The rapture is going to be a great thing. The Bible describes in the book of Thessalonians that there's going to be a shout. There's going to be a trumpet. Listen to me, folks. This is not going to be some quiet event. I know some of you are old enough to remember the 70s movies of a thief in the night and, and you know the wife is cooking in the kitchen and she says something to the husband and he doesn't hear her and she says something again and he doesn't hear her and she goes in there and his razor's just vibrating in the sink and he's gone you know he didn't even leave his clothes behind he's just gone you know kind of a thing and it was so quiet that she didn't even hear the return of Christ while cooking eggs listen to me it will be with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And I don't know what the shout will be, but I cannot help but think as much as the Bible talks about this, that just maybe the shout will be, here comes the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I don't even know what the trumpet is going to sound like, but I promise you this, it'll be beautiful, and it'll be loud, and it'll be joyful to God's children when the trumpet is blown and we're brought up into heaven above. The Bible says very clearly that this is going to be an event that will not be so silent that nobody knows it happened. It's going to happen. And it's joyful news to those who are ready for it. It's joyful news to those who are ready for it. When Jesus says, I'll come again, listen to me, folks, that's, that's just the good news for you and I, but what are we doing about that good news? This is what we should be doing. Number one, we should be living for His return. Yes. That means to do the words of Jesus, we must work while it is still day because night is coming. Yes. There's a lot left to be done, folks. Yes. You still have unsaved neighbors you've been inviting to church. We all still have unsaved family members that need to come to Christ and be a believer. There's so much work left to be done. So we must work, live for Him, do the King's business till He returns. When Jesus shows up, listen to me, folks, I want to be found in the mission field of life, reaching people for Jesus Christ. I want to be found working for Him when He shows up. We not only should live for Him, but we should also long for the return of Christ. We should long for the return of Christ. I cannot stand it when my wife takes a trip without me. I just can't. It's the truth. I can't. She's over. She won't even look at me. She's over there shaking her head. I can't. She has to take trips occasionally. And one of the hardest ones for me is when she went back to Nigeria to be with her family. I was glad for that part. I'm just selfish enough. I was more sad for me. <laughs> I was left all alone. She was surrounded by all kinds of family and friends. It's the earliest I've ever been to the airport for someone arriving. <laughs> 
earliest. I promise you, it was the earliest I had ever been for an arriving flight. I've been there long enough. I think I'd have one or two meals, a couple of cups of coffee, you know. <laughs> Took a tour of the airport. Got to know Bob down in housekeeping, you know. I, you know. <laughs> I mean, I was like, they were like, dude, you need a job? You know, you've been there long enough, you know. <laughs> When the plane lands, it's so slow. You know, the you know, and then I see it, and I'm like, well, that one wasn't it. Here comes another one, and then all of a sudden, this one starts coming close to my gate where she's supposed to be. You know, and then it kept going. I'm like, oh man, you know, and then finally, I see one coming to the gate, about to make the connection, and I'm like, okay, what is? I will work now. Do you need someone to work? I will work right now. I will get that plane unloaded in a minute. <laughs> All of a sudden, finally it lands, and she comes out, and I meant to have a picture on the PowerPoint, so I'll just have to do it for you, but during the COVID days, I had to wear a mask and stuff, but I had a big old sign up that said, my love, that's, my, that's what I call her, my love. You know how people do the name, thank you, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Five ladies just went on, six of you just elbowed your husband. <laughs> I'm holding this sign that says, sign that says my love. You wouldn't believe how many people came by making comments about it. One guy, true story, one guy came by and said, man, I am in all kinds of trouble now. You know? <laughs> another guy asked me, he said, hey, do you have another piece of paper and a pen? You know? <laughs> You know, kind of a thing. And I'm standing out there. We even had people that wanted to take a picture of us when my wife got off and we were together, you know. And, and I, didn't have, I didn't have my phone to do it, and they texted me the picture, you know. And I was just sitting there because I was longing for it. Why was I longing for it? Because the person on this planet, after Jesus Christ, that means the absolute most to me is my best friend, my wife. So to be away from her for a week might as well have been 100 years. I wanted her back. So the whole time she was gone, I was longing for her return. You and I should be the same way with Jesus Christ. We should be longing for the return of Jesus Christ. Number three is this. We not only should live for his return, long for his return, but we should be looking for the return of Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way in Titus chapter 2, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope you are going to stand on these promises of God because they're yea and amen. More than anything, if I leave you with any one thing you're going to take away today, let's get ready for the rapture. Let's get ready for the return of Christ. If there's ever been a time when it's closer than ever before, it's right now. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. We're ever so grateful for you, God, especially your word this morning, God, the way it just rolls out of your word to, onto our lives, into our hearts, into our minds, God. Father, I ask you that we would begin, God, to live our lives in such a way that when you come back, you will find us faithful in doing the work of the Master. That you'll find us of a church excited to see you, longing for your presence, God. And Father, when you show up, it won't catch us by surprise because all day we've been looking to the eastern sky for your return, God. Father, give us those kind of hearts and those kind of lives. In your name we pray, amen. Stand with us this morning. Very few songs would be a better dedication than the one we're about to sing. Let's